Welcome, as always, to everyone tuning in tonight on Zoom and on Facebook. My name is Robin Brown, and I'm joining you from the traditional unceded territory, territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And I'm delighted to be joined, as always, by my co-host Libby Davies for tonight's Off the Hill political panel. Well, thank you, Robin, and hello, everyone. I'm glad to be joining you all this evening. I live on the unceded traditional and ancestral territory, territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish Coast Salish peoples. And uh, we are glad to be here with our panelists uh, tonight for our last panel of the year and a debrief on the recent speech from the throne. So tonight we are joined by uh, Leah Gazan. Welcome, Leah. Leah is an MP for uh, Winnipeg Center and the NDP critic for children, families, and social development, as well as the deputy critic for immigration, refugees, and citizenship. And we have Elle Jones. Welcome, Elle, joining us for the first time. Elle is a poet, journalist, professor, and activist living in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, Clayton Thomas Mueller, welcome, Clayton. Also, I believe joining us for the first time is, a, is an indigenous activist, campaigner, and public speaker who serves on the board of multiple environmental organizations, including the Bioneers, Black Mesa Water Coalition, and the Wildfire Project. He's also author of Life in the City of Dirty Water. And, and last but not least, Carl Nuremberg, uh, one of our regular panelists, Carl is an award-winning journalist, broadcaster, and filmmaker who works in both English and French. And Carl joined Ravel as parliamentary correspondent in 2011. So welcome to all our panelists. And uh, now over to you, Libby. Okay, thanks, Rowan, and we'll get going here. So for those of you watching on Zoom, please participate in the chat, or you can ask questions to our panelists through the Q&A function. And of course, we'll do our best as always to address your questions because we do want to hear from you. And for those of you who are watching on Facebook, a welcome to you. So last week we heard the speech from the throne and some of you may wonder why we call this month's panel Games of the Throne. It isn't just a cute take on the popular TV series, but I guess a bit of a poke at the antics that can unfold as the first confidence motion faces the government, particularly in a minority parliament. While always infamously general speeches from the throne, and to quote Karl Nuremberg's recent column, quote, empty of real meaning, nevertheless, a speech from the throne is an initial framing from the government of its agenda and I think, you know, it's often more about what is not in the speech than what is that is of significant note. So I think we'll begin with you, Leah, because you were there, you took it all in. What was your takeaway from the speech from the throne and why? Well, you know, I have to say, uh, I agree with Carl. I think it was missing a lot of a lot of things, including uh, things that certainly the NDP had pushed for a wealth tax, you know, something that is really critical. Who's going to pay for the pandemic? Well, we know who now, you know, currently there are seniors in my riding uh, being cut off GIS uh, because they're utilizing the CRB and serve uh, income as part of income. They're now losing their GIS. The same thing is happening to families who are beginning cut off the child tax benefit. And it seems like people continue to pay for it while this government continues to invest in pipelines, uh, you know, invest in uh, fighter jets, uh, you know, where they're looking at, you know, invest, investing in um, warships. Meanwhile, people are really struggling. Inflation is growing. We know that. But the cost of the inflation cannot be on the backs of the people and our and our environment. Yeah. And were you surprised, Leah, that there was so little of substance in terms of the climate emergency? Like there was no reference really to COP26, to what the government plans to do. I mean, it was it was really quite uh, vacuous. Well, I, I actually wasn't surprised. And actually, mm -hmm. we are we are doing, uh, you know, it, some doing the worst. Uh, out of you know all G7 countries, I mean we we have shown where our priorities are. You know TMX pipeline, uh, LNG, uh, 
all of this investment in fossil fuels, a uh, little or no investment in a, in a just transition. Workers are not doing well. There is no discussions about things like a JLBI, a guaranteed livable basic income, to assist people in even having the choice uh, to support and move out of a just transition. I think it's the same old, same old. And without being hyper partisan, uh, I think our you know all parties have to be on board with bold climate action. Uh, we are in a climate uh, crisis. We see that out uh, in BC uh, right now. Uh, we see that out east. We need, uh, I, I'm disappointed that we don't have a budget that shows a clear commitment to taking bold actions against the climate emergency and taking bold actions to make sure that people can thrive, not just survive, and that life doesn't get harder for families and uh, individuals uh, in Canada. Over to you, Robin. Thanks, Lou. Um, let's go to Elle. Elle, and, uh, again, welcome to, the, to our, our panel. Um, in a recent article, you noted the importance of organizing uh, at the grassroots, like outside the system for serious change. Did you hear anything at all convincing in a throne speech regarding the government's commitment to ending systemic racism in general and anti-black racism in particular and uh, how should grassroots organi organizers respond to what was in the speech? Okay, so I'll take this a little bit at a time. Um, the word black, and as reference to us, only appears in this speech once. We appear as though summoned by the mention of justice because it's always imagined that there's only certain issues that are black issues. So even though we're talking about things like pandemic recovery, um, you know, all kinds of issues. The environment affects black people, of course, environmental racism particularly impacts indigenous and black communities, but there's no specific mention. And then the minute you say justice, here come black people. But of course, there's nothing substantial around that. In fact, justice reform gets a whole sentence in the speech and it just says we will continue to work on justice reform. Of course, it's not clear what has even happened on justice reform. We did get the um, gesture towards ending mandatory minimums on uh, drug charges, for example, but crowns and police maintain their prosecution. So we know that, I mean, maintain a discretion. So we know that there will be no changes because white people already don't get convicted and charged on drug offenses are almost entirely directed towards black and indigenous people at this point. Um, and then later on in the speech, we get a, a surety that we will continue to be tough on guns and be tougher on guns. And of course we know the discourse around borders, guns, drugs, and gangs. This is extremely racialized discourse. So what we've actually seen on justice reform is they've gestured towards white people essentially and said, don't worry, your child won't go to jail if they're caught with drugs. But then they're like, don't worry though, guns, we're still gonna prosecute these black people. And she talks about gun violence in our major cities, except the biggest gun crime in Canada in recent years was in Port of Peak, Nova Scotia, a white man who dressed up as a cop and mass shoot shot everybody. So that's not in a major city and it was a white man. So we're not interested in addressing gun violence when it's, you know, uh, a white man driving around dressed as a cop. But what we're saying is, don't worry, these black guys in Toronto, essentially, uh, we're going to make sure that we continue to throw them in jail and build prisons. So you cannot, of course, have any kind of justice reform while you maintain anti-black ideas around who's a criminal, around the idea of harsh policing and punishment. And of course, this kind of pandering to the tough on crime crowd, like, God forbid, should we actually just say that we need to defund the police, we need to stop investing in punishment, we need to start investing in things like the environment, COVID recovery, housing, child childcare, mental health treatment, and we don't see any of those specifics. So in terms of Black people, we, as usual, remain almost entirely absented from these speeches as though we do not exist. Although I suppose existing doesn't do you much either because Indigenous people get mentioned. There's no, no better, like if you're mentioned, then you're just mentioned performatively and you still don't get anything. So we don't see anything substantive in this. Um, beyond that, in terms of grassroots change, I think the justice issue is a really um, good one to use as an example. In 2020, in both the Black and Indigenous communities across Canada, we were out in the streets in force to protest, of, obviously first in the wake of George Floyd, but particularly not just in response to something in the US, but specifically in the response to a number of killings of Indigenous people across this country. I think there was like three killings in one week, including a 16-year-old child, uh, Aisha Hudson in Winnipeg. Um, you know, the, the uh, Regis Korczynski Paquette. Um, we had so many deaths all at once and people in Canada were coming out specifically to say that this is an issue in Canada. And we had a mass movement. And what have we got from it? 
Uh, we have we got exactly a, a drug bill that doesn't properly decriminalize drugs. We can't even get full decrim in this country, even though other countries have it. We're still building more prisons. And what we've got is a few more faces around the table and money for entrepreneurship funds that have nothing to do with what we were actually putting our bodies on the line for. And today we have people being criminalized for uh, fighting encampments clearance for the unhoused people. Six black youth were just arrested in Hamilton. We have, of course, people out in Wet'suwet'en not only getting arrested on their ancestral lands, but indigenous people who came from across Canada uh, being arrested simply for being on the territory, being placed in dog cages, essentially, and paraded in court in their underwear. And many of those people are, of course, fighting things like a housing tract being placed on your own reserve in Six Nations. So uh, on and on and on, we've actually seen an intensification of the criminalization of our people across this land, an intensification of building jails and prisons, an intensification of funding the police. In fact, virtually every police department got more funds this year. Um, and it shows you that we can't direct our energies towards saying, oh, we just need the government to do this. We just need a black cop. We just need a black justice minister. We just need you know, a bit of more policy. We need wholesale change. And that is what we really have to work to fight for. One last thing I'll say before I end this long answer, but in my defense, it was a complex question. Uh, right before I got on this uh, Zoom, I was talking to some of the guys inside Collins Bay, the Black people who are incarcerated in Collins Bay, which is one of the prisons where many, many Black people are incarcerated. And they were giving me a bit of hell because they're like, uh, you know, like, why don't you get out there and say our stories more? You got to use your clout for us. And I was trying to say that, you know, you got to pick your spots. It's hard and people don't want to listen. So on their behalf, I want to say that there are so many Black men and Indigenous people and women as well, and people that are non-binary and trans. I don't want to pretend it's, you know, a gender binary here, but um, so many people that are serving unjust sentences, that are serving time for either offenses they did not commit or of serving really um, enhanced sentences, particularly this happens to Black and Indigenous people. Uh, many, many Black men convicted on things like gun charges and gang charges that are completely bogus. Um, and these are the things we actually need to turn our attention to. Uh, we've refused to fight for the people who need it the most, the people who scare us the most, the people with the worst sentences, the people who are the bad people, the people committing the gun violence. Everybody pretends those people don't exist. And if we pretend those people don't exist, we cannot fight for justice in this country because justice does not belong to some of us. It belongs to all of us. So I will never ride with a throne speech until it talks about Black people doing gun charges, until it dismantles the idea that Black people are the worst criminals, until it advocates for status for all, until it advocates for sovereignty of Indigenous land and respect for Indigenous territory. Like, until we hear those things, uh, there is absolutely nothing that anybody can really say that is helpful to us, and we will continue to organize outside the system for liberation. So that's my long rant. Thank you, Robin. No, no, thank you. Thank you. And actually, just before I pass it to Libby, I'll make, you made a comment about... Um uh police budgets so just a um report from ottawa so after a year of um public advocacy here um telling the Ottawa police services board to freeze the budget they gave the police force an extra uh, 11 million dollars so over to you libby okay well um l i sure wish you could have written the speech from the throne <laughs> That would have been a barn burner. It's that that was that was awesome, and I'm now going to uh, turn to Clayton. Uh, Clayton, a very special welcome to you because it's your first time uh, on Off the Hill, the political panel. And I wanted to say how much I'm enjoying your new book, Life in the City of Dirty Water. It's a, an amazing book. Congratulations on your book, and I, I guess I'll, yeah. Um, since our last Off the Hill panel, a lot has happened. COP26 happened, of course, with the usual media hype and subsequent disappointment. We've had the ongoing climate emergency in BC that, of course, Leah referred to, and the violent arrest of Wet'suwet'en land defenders. So, Clayton, what does this say about the government's commitment to address the climate emergency and reconciliation in a meaningful way. What did you read into the speech from the throne? What did you take away from it? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me here this evening. It's such an honor to be on such an incredible panel. Uh, Leah and Elle, like my, my, my heart to everything that you have expressed uh, so far. Um, I mean, COP26, uh, you know, Canada, along with governments of the world, um, 
you know, have basically committed to a trajectory that will allow for a 2.5 and above even uh, climate degree shift on Mother Earth, which is, uh, you know, is an end game when it comes to small island nations and other, um, you know, coastal uh, populations all across the planet, um, as well as, you know, Arctic based indigenous peoples, um, you know, here in these plants that they call Canada. In regards to Wet'suwet'en, um, you know, I think Indigenous peoples are once again showing that they are doing the hard lifting when it comes to climate action in Canada by standing in the way of dangerous fossil fuel expansion. Um, their actions deserve solidarity and support, not attacks from militarized police, uh, especially when those police's pension funds are invested in coastal gas link and are working for governments who are trying to sell themselves as climate leaders on the world stage. And, you know, I think when we think about climate impacts and, you know, what's going down in BC, um, you know, this year, the TMX project, you know, the Trans Mountain Pipeline has been delayed by heat, fire, floods, landslides. I mean, it's almost as if Creator is helping shut down Canada. Um, you know, and this project is overpriced unnecessarily and multiple experts have pointed out that it can cannot be built if we hope to keep temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. You know, it's time for Canada to do the only rational thing here and pause construction and initiate a formal review and reconsideration of the Trans Mountain Expansion Project. And then, you know, I think the thing that most disturbed me about the throne speech was that right before, you know, government went into holiday, you know, uh, Minister O'Regan, you know, you know, made a commitment uh, by the Liberal government to a Just Transition Act. And, you know, Justin Trudeau left Just Transition out of his throne speech. Um, so the obvious question um, is if his government is again going to drop the ball and break their promise to deliver a Just Transition Act, you know, we can't tackle the climate emergency without a plan to get off of fossil fuels and to support workers and communities, First Nations, uh, while we do it. And dropping the Just Transition Act would be a sign that Trudeau just isn't serious about actually tackling the climate crisis. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think, Clayton, you really give the strong point that, you know, um, the heavy lifting that's been done, but also we've got to sustain the actions that go on to keep the pressure up on Parliament overall. So thank you for that. Um, over to you, Robin. Yeah, no, thanks, Livian. Thanks, uh, thanks, Clayton. Um, Carl, let's bring you into this. Uh, you've covered many throne speeches and from the sounds of one of your latest articles, uh, it sounds like this one uh, was particularly disappointing to you. Uh, what are the key things that you uh, had hoped to see that weren't there? Well, I mean, I don't know whether it, uh, it's fair to say one hopes for anything from this this gang, but um, it, a colleague of mine uh, who was on CBC uh, a press gallery colleague who was on the CBC panel uh, on the National uh, Althea Raj says, you know why they're so successful electorally the Liberals, they they're the Goldilocks party, uh, not too hot, not too cold. So she pointed out that. Um, uh, after the speech, we had the Conservatives criticizing them for being the enemies of the oil and gas industry, and the Bloc saying, "Well, no, they're just weak, way too weak on all that." And they say, "And, they, and uh, in Althea's mind, that's just where they want to be, somewhere in the middle." But of course, another way of looking at it is when you're in the middle and you're sitting on the fence. Well, sometimes that can be pretty uncomfortable sitting on the fence, you know, depending on which part of your anatomy is in contact with which part of the fence, and. Um, you know, just to pick up on the point that um, Clayton was raising, uh, we talk, I mean, I mentioned that uh, when I wrote about it, there's nothing about just transition. That's one glaring omission in the speech, not a word. The word just transition doesn't happen. There's nothing about the great challenge of achieving, uh, achieving an end to the use of fossil fuels in a just and a fair and a reasonable way, because it'll never happen if you can't do it that way. You, if you can't bring the people who, who earn their living from it uh, on on board, you're going to be in big trouble. Instead, they, they, they have this line after some pretty fairly pabulum weak stuff about 
well, we're going to sort of meet climate objectives. It was amazing. I was shocked at how weak that part was, considering that they just come back. They were still unpacking their bags from Glasgow when they wrote this, when they were preparing for this throne speech. And they sort of like, boy, amnesia. Like, if you forget they were even there. They did. They, there's so many stuff, so much stuff that happened there didn't make get anywhere even the slightest echo. And after having talked a little bit in this very weak way about how we're going to do something, for instance, climate emergencies as of the sort we're having in British Columbia, climate uh, climate crises, uh, literal crises, driving people's floods and earth and and, and similar um, events. They said we're going to provide help to people. That was what they offered. They said they're going to provide. I can imagine in British Columbia the cheers of thousands of people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. The government says they're going to provide help. Well, we were worried they wouldn't. But, you know, another thing they say, after saying all that, they have this line very clear. While the government takes strong action to fight climate change, it will also work just as hard to get Canadian resources to new markets. Just before Glasgow, we had an expert study that said, in many ways... Canada's contribution to global warming via our exports is greater than via the the um, con what we consume of green uh, and what we produce in Canada itself. And yet they're saying that they somehow are going to twist themselves in a pretzel and they're going to be all things to all people and do both of them at the same time. And not a single word about again the the, the issue that came up at Glasgow, the the, the high subsidies that we pay to the oil and gas industries. And people are wondering what we mean by that. You know, the, being in the oil business is considered a high risk business and governments uh, for generations have given uh, the companies a huge write offs on their exploration activity. So they basically, they don't pay, they don't pay tax on the money that they invest in exploration development and finding new resources. And we continue to treat the, this industry in the same way as a kind of high risk industry that's necessary to coddle and foster. Not a word about that. So, I mean, I, I mean, I did mention it. I'll, I'll just end it there. The, just to switch from climate change uh, to other issues. And again, I would echo what others have said about indigenous people. I mean, if they were to talk about something about making reconciliation making reconciliation meaningful, the way to make reconciliation meaningful is to recognize there's not only the apology agenda, there's not only the symbols agenda, there's not only appointing a very good person, a decent person, to the powerless position of governor general, a position with zero power uh, and is only symbolic, but there's also that what we'd have to call the hard brass tax economic agenda. There's the natural resources agenda. There's the land and territory agenda. Not a word about that. They avoid that. They never talk about that. I mean, I was witness to the early talk, the beginning of awareness of these issues, because I'm so old, going back to the James Bay Agreement of the 1970s, to the Berger inquiry into the Mackenzie Valley uh, later in the 1970s. And then they get to their favorite subject. They love talking about this all the time, the middle class. But you know what? Even whoever they, I, I, I'm always wondering, would you, I, I want to ask Justin Trudeau, would you introduce me to them? Like, who does that, who, who gets the, who's in there? Who, who, how do you get a membership? Is there going to be like a middle class passport, like a vaccine passport we're going to hand out to people? We're going to get like a thumbprint or something? You're a middle class, so we love you. Oh, middle class to do all, it's worse, probably, it's nothing. They have, they have, we got rid of the middle class prosperity minister because they, nobody could figure out what she was supposed to do. They actually gave her a real job. And the only thing they mentioned there is they're going to lower cell phone bills by the huge amount of 25%. They'll still be three times as high as everybody else, but we're going to, and they don't say how or when or anything. They're just going to do that. And then they're going to give more support to students. What? We don't know. We're not sure. So this is really, you know, actually, Yves-Francois Blanchet, the leader of the Bloc Québécois, not my favorite person, I'll be perfectly honest, um, happy to play at the biggest game when it suits him, but he said a junior, high school, a junior college student could have written his throne speech in an afternoon. Yeah. This is well, really Carl, a pathetic effort. 
I'm going to I'm going to jump in there as, sorry. As, as no no don't be sorry you're you're full of illumination as always so thank you um, but I'm going to I I'm going to switch gears because time is moving on and as Robin mentioned at the opening um, this is our last panel of the year so let's talk a little bit about 2021 and what I'd love us to do is just do a very quick go around for any of our panelists who would like to jump in and to name a good thing that happened over the, the year that needs to continue. And conversely, to identify something or someone that we need to put to rest. So anyone care to jump in on that one? L, do I see your- oh, I'll start with the second one. And the person we need to put to rest is, okay, and I don't mean this to sound, this is gonna sound bad, I realize the phrasing. So not put to rest like dead, but we yeah, need yeah. to get rid of the queen. Like Barbados obviously has become a republic, um, past time for the rest of us to do so. Um, I'm tired of seeing her face on the money. I definitely don't wanna see Charles's face on the money. Now I understand of course that indigenous relations are with the crown. So obviously indigenous people need to be leading this, but you know, that monarchy's hands are blood drenched. They've gone across this, this planet and committed genocide. Literally, you can spin a globe, put your finger down, including the ocean and hit a place where the British committed some massacre, some famine, some, you know, clearance. Virtually all the conflicts we have in the world today have their roots in British imperialism. And they've got off Scott, Scott clean. You know, people think the queen's a lovable woman in a hat. My own mother lived in a time in a colonized country. My grandfather was incarcerated for sedition, for, you know, advocating for independence of the colony of Trinidad. You know, these things are in the lifetimes of people in our families. So uh, we need to really start coming to terms with the colonial history with its blood soaked genocidal vicious history these people should not be able to walk in public without being booed and having garbage thrown on them um, so it's long past time to get rid of them now a good thing oh lord that's so hard i feel like this year has been actually a really tough year um you know we had the high of 2020 where it felt like we were really moving places and I think a lot of what has happened this year has been the appropriation of the energy of our movements. Um, you know, many people from the respectable bourgeois neoliberal classes, like overtly co-opting what we're doing. Um, I mentioned this before, but it's been a, a huge thorn in my side that we were fighting for black lives and for justice. And somehow that has all turned into business and entrepreneurship. The only things we seem to have got in the black community have, have to do with business. And I'm not against people starting their businesses, but how did we move from stop killing us to just give us not even a grant, but a business loan that we have to pay back? Like, how is that justice? So, you know, how do we have bankers trying to lead our liberation movements that made their money off mining and oil extraction. And now they're, they're being called front and center as leaders in the black community. It makes no, it makes, I was gonna say it makes no sense, but of course it makes sense because they don't want us to have liberation. They don't want us to be free. They certainly don't want us challenging the military, challenging environmental destruction, challenging the punishment regime. So this year has actually been hard, but I suppose the thing that always continues to inspire me is uh, the organizing on the ground. Um, you know, the guys in prison and the women in prison that are organizing in the most terrible circumstances. You know, there's been a lot of migrant uh, worker organizing, particularly in the wake of COVID, where people really recognize how valueless these lives are to Canada when people can come in, no path to status, work on the front lines of a, a care home, die, get COVID, and not even have any right to claim health care. So uh, we've seen a lot of organizing there. Um, so those things I always, you know, I always look to, you know, the people in the worst circumstances that continue to fight and organize. But yeah. I think in many ways we failed our movement this year. And I think we really need to get back on track. Um, we really need to understand that this isn't about clout. This isn't about getting titles. This isn't about a few more people on the university Senate. This is about people in shelters, people in tents, people in prisons, people trying to cross the border, people trying to feed their children. Um, you know, we're losing all of that. Uh, we, we have no discourse on the left about the military, no discourse. And that's an environmental issue, right? Like how do we have a green party in this country that doesn't talk about militarization? Like when the, the biggest polluters are the military. So I think the left in particular really needs to reorganize, to, to really get on the same page, maybe hold some convergences and recommit to this vision of liberation. Cause I, this year has been kind of a downer on that front, I think. Well, sobering thoughts. Um, anybody else care to jump in um, in terms yeah, of- Yeah, I'm happy yeah. to. Yeah, Clayton, go for it. Um, 
Yeah, I just uh, fist up in solidarity to what uh, Elle has been expressing. You know, I, I um, when it comes to military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex and just the kind of disproportionate burden, um, you know, and oppression, I think that that our shared communities experience here in these lands that they call Canada, it's, it's pretty wild, um, you know. And I, I just feel like, you know, when we look at the demographic of workers entering the labor market in the next decade, you know, with all the boomers, the white boomers, you know, retiring in this like emerging late labor crisis that they've been talking about in the labor sector for some time, you know, it's migrants, it's immigrants, it's uh, brown, black, indigenous peoples that are going to represent the vast majority of new workers in the new economy. You know, this one that we're building in response to the global triple threat of the COVID pandemic, the, the, the international economic recession at a scale that we've never seen. And of course, the existential threat of climate change. And, you know, I get a lot of hope when I look at that because, you know, while Indigenous women are the highest, uh, you know, rising population in Canada's prison population right now, in the next decade, there is going to be the biggest transference of economic power to the most marginalized populations in this country, you know, this young country that they, this young settler colonial state they call Canada. And, um, you know, for a lot of us Native people, that represents the manifestation of prophecies like the seventh generation uh, prophecy, like the eighth fire prophecy of the Anishinaabe people. And um, I think, I think for me, you know, as far as like, you know, something that happened this year that was positive. I wouldn't say it would be positive, you know, and I'm very conscious about that. But I know for myself, as a as a child of Indian residential school survivors, um, it was a big deal, you know, for these all these little children that never got to go home, you know, these 7000 plus unmarked graves um, that got unearthed, um, you know, with many more probably to come over the months in the next couple of years as they do the investigations at these hundred plus sites, um, you know, both here in Canada and the United States. Um, it represents a, 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 a opportunity for these little spirits to finally go home to the good hunting grounds and for there to be like closure for the families that were impacted by this genocidal policy. You know, it's a big deal when my mom told me about you know, about, uh, you know, I, I brought this issue up with her and I, I mentioned the, the unmarked graves found at the uh, Brandon, Manitoba Indian Residential School. And she's like, oh, just casually, that's where your dad went. And I was like, what? <laughs> because neither her or my father told me that that's where he went to residential school. But my dad lost his virginity to a nun at Indian Residential School when he was just a boy um, at that school. So for me, you know, it, it represented this, this immense closure and just this unknown terror and, you know, just kind of like some kind of rational way forward through this messy process of um, reconciliation, you know, and there's so much more to add to that discourse in regards to turning the horse before the cart again, because, you know, we're so sick of apologies as Native people and studies um, you know, when we talk about reconciliation, truth and reconciliation, we talk about that. We're talking about reparations. We're talking about land back. You know, the reason that our people continue to suffer these socioeconomic crises is because we control less than 1% of Canada's land mass. You know, we want to have control over our land without being interfered with by provincial governments or by corporations like Coastal Gas Link or like Trans Mountain Pipeline or by Justin Trudeau, you know. And as far as like, who do we need to cancel? Well, there's a delegation of our indigenous leaders that are going to visit the Vatican here in the next month. They're gonna go sit down with the Pope and ask for an apology over the role of the Catholic church and in Indian residential schools. And, you know, I think this dude needs to be canceled. Like in the, in the Vatican, it's one of the biggest landholders, you know, on mother earth. Um, if the Vatican is serious about reconciliation, then they need to give whatever land holdings they hold here in so-called Canada back to the indigenous peoples that those land holdings are, are, you know, within their traditional territories exist. And if they're serious about like doing the right, repairing the wrong over their role in Indian residential school, then the Vatican, one of the richest institutions in the world, needs to give these individual students that are still surviving and the families of those that did not survive a substantial cash settlement. Um, you know, so that they're, you know, and not just like 10000 or $30,000 like Canada did, like I'm talking like a serious, you know, cash settlement 
where these people and their children don't have to suffer anymore, at least economically, and they can afford therapy and all the kind of health, you know, preventative like health care that they could buy if they had money. Um, you know, so yeah, like, you know, th that's my commentary on like who needs to get canceled or who needs to get like held accountable. It's the Pope. Well, he needs to humble yeah. himself with this meeting coming up with indigenous leaders. Well, you, you guys both went big, the queen and the Pope. Uh, way to go. <laughs> um, I'm just going to ask Leah, um, uh, I can say one good thing that needs to continue for all of us is the fact that you're back in Parliament. Uh, <laughs> Fantastic, uh, you're our, our shining star there. So, um, but but for you, um, you know, it was a busy year, an election nobody wanted. Um, anything stand out for you now that we're coming to the end of the year in terms of like the negative or the positive? So, you know, amazing commentary tonight. Just want to give a shout out to that. I'm like, oh, I want to vote for that party. But anyway. <laughs> Just amazing. Just loving it. Um, I think we're at a, a time of reckoning and truth uh, because our very survival depends on this. You know, we spoke a lot this evening about the climate catastrophe, uh, you know, the recovery of children, you know, um, in unmarked graves. I'm st my, my family, most of my family went to Labrette, you know, um, you know, I'm waiting for that search to start. And, um, you know, I think it's a time of reckoning, a time of truth that is coming uh, forward where there is no denying. And we're at a point whether we accept that truth and actually take actions to change or we maintain the status quo. That's the point we're at. And I certainly saw in the throne speech uh, that we're still in a place where we want to um, maintain the status quo, that there is a history of genocide and now a, a growing history of performative politics and allyship uh, in this country. Um, and that needs to change. And if it changes, uh, I think we have hope for survival. Here's the good thing. Okay. Uh, here's the here is the good thing about it. In in the in midst of this time of reckoning, uh, I see growing solidarity within movements, uh, the BIPOC movements, the climate justice movements, because now people are coming together in common cause, and the climate catastrophe, uh, the current climate crisis, I think, is one thing that is bringing all these movements together because you can't have one thing without the other. You know, everything is connected, the climate crisis, economic justice, social justice, uh, land, you know, colonization, it's all in one big circle. And that circle is coming together and people are coming together. I think we need a movement. I think our very survival on earth requires a movement and truth and truth with action. And I see that building and that's what gives me hope. Uh, that's what gives me hope to go into the most colonial, racist, vile, misogynistic institution on this land called the House of Commons to listen to visceral racism every single day to hear my rights up for debate, silence on the fact that two Indigenous women or Indigenous women in Wasotan territory had their door taken down with a chainsaw and an axe. Two symbols, I, I can't think of any two symbols more vi violent than a chainsaw and an axe to almost radio silence across the board. It is a time of reckoning and it is the movement that is going to make the difference to push people in positions of power to do what they need to do, to do the right thing, uh, to, to fight for a better world for all. And that means lifting up human rights for all, uh, taking down privileged situation that, that results in the death of people. What we saw it during the, the, the heat waves uh, in uh, British Columbia. Uh, Elle, you mentioned the three deaths 
uh, happened uh, in my riding uh, of indigenous people. These systems, systemic racism kills. Uh, the climate catastrophe is killing uh, individuals. Now is the time to rise in a movement and I feel people are doing it and that gives me hope. And I think that is the highlight is the unity that's building uh, of this of this time of reckoning. Yeah, thanks, Leah. And just a, a very quick follow up to that when you talk about your sense that the movement is building and there's solidarity and people are rising. Do you have any sense that that pressure is being felt on the inside, so to speak? I mean, we've seen the situation here in BC of the land defenders. Um, uh, there is a lot of pressure on the BC government for sure. Uh, do you have any sense, though, that that pressure is being felt at the elected level? Well, I think, you know, the one thing I know about being in Ottawa for, you know, a very short time is that one of the most important things here is maintaining your power and privilege. So if people feel that their power and privilege is being threatened, then they start changing their tune. It's about what do I need to do to maintain my power and privilege? And I think doing nothing and staying silent, particularly in the midst of a climate emergency, uh, a growing corporate dictatorship, uh, you know, uh, glaring systemic racism that costs lives. Uh, there is growing pressure on elected officials uh, as legislators in this country to change that. Um, so absolutely, when people on the ground say, oh, it's like they don't hear, when people's power and privilege is threatened, they hear. So I say, keep rising, and we need keep to keep building the movement. Uh, I think that will save the day. I believe so, that. I'm so glad to hear you say that, Leah. Um, back to you, Robin. I know you've got um, another question in terms of 2022 coming up, and then we'll we'll try and get some questions from the uh, from the people who are listening in. Uh, yeah. No. Thank you, everybody. Um, so last year, Rabble launched a reader survey of uh, Rabble Rouses to Watch in the year ahead. So um, who do you all think that we should be paying attention to in 2022? Um, shall we reverse it? So we start with Leah, perhaps? <laughs> well, I think we have some pretty rad people on the panel. Just drop it out. Um, <laughs> I just, I think there's a lot of, um, I mean, and I, and I mean that sincerely. Um, I, th I think there's a lot of critical voices uh, right now um, who uh, raise their voice in all different kinds of ways, whether it's in, you know, grassroots leadership, through art, uh, through writing, through poetry. I know, uh, El, you know, I saw that you write poetry. I haven't read your poetry. I'm like, why have I not read Elle's poetry? What's wrong with me? clearly have not lived yet but um you know um i think there's a it, lot it of has people to be heard it's not really reading it's spoken so you're good <laughs> okay okay great great so so you know i think um there's a lot of people to watch uh, that are that are that are up and coming i think certainly i would say uh, william and cheyenne the the uh william is the father of aisha hudson uh, there's an inquest going on, uh, you know, in spite of their loss, they've been leading uh, the way uh, around uh, police violence that resulted in the death of their 16-year-old daughter. I certainly would keep an eye out on what's, what goes on there uh, uh, in Manitoba um, and just so many, so many others uh, across the country. It's certainly the West Soweton um, you know, uh, what's happening in the Wet'suwet'en territory, the kind of solidarity movements. I think it's bigger than individuals. I think we need to look beyond an individual at this point to collectives mm -hmm. and collective action. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, Go ahead, Clayton. Yeah, uh, you know, definitely I uh, want to give a big shout out to uh, Desmond Cole, uh, to T.O., you know, like that dude needs to be watched. Um, you know, and that whole circle of, um, you know, just like black liberation work being done in Toronto is like so badass and like needs so much resourcing and like super 
powerful connections with the like migrant justice movement and the indigenous rights movement. You know, we're building, eh? And there's conversations that are happening. I've never met Desmond Cole, but yeah, I just wanted to shout that out that, you know, we're all watching each other and there are conversations happening between good relatives, between these social movements. As we build the biggest social movement, people powered movement in the history of humankind to deal with these existential threats we've been talking about on tonight's panel. Um, I certainly want to give a shout out to the youth the indigenous youth, um, not just in so-called BC, but you know, names like Takaya Blaney and her older sister Siliam Hamilton, um, you know, they went to COP26 and just rocked the house, um, you know, and have been rocking the house in so-called BC in support of Wet'suwet'en and support of indigenous nations fighting the coastal, or sorry, the Trans Mountain Pipeline project, and just fighting for you know the right that our people have to self-determination and sovereignty and yeah, just build it on the just recognition of um, the people of what Stuarton's traditional clan houses, not just like, but specifically focusing on, especially the women leaders like Molly Wickham, uh, Frida Hudson. Um, you know, there's a lot of powerful, powerful matriarchs in that crew um, that are, you know, standing with some of the hereditary chiefs, um, you know, that are men and everyone in between. Um, you know, and they're doing powerful work and uh, we all need to be supporting them and resourcing that movement as well. You know, and I just think that, you know, the ongoing work that, you know, so many grassroots organizations and women in particular, indigenous women that are doing, you know, that they're doing across the country in regards to the lack of action, um, you know, uh, on the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls issue in this country, the scandal around that, you know, we need to be finding pathways, uh, whether it's through volunteer services or the donation of, of, you know, everything from feminine hygiene products to clothing to straight up get donating cash. Uh, we need to be supporting those organizations across the country that are reacting and, you know, showing leadership to the crisis of murdered and missing indigenous women across this country, which, you know, the federal government just still is delaying on. They're delaying and delaying and delaying. And, you know, and we, but there are groups out there that are doing incredible work and we need to be supporting them in that work. I'm so glad to see all the love for Desmond coming through the chat and, and uh, you know, in uh, Mew Clayton. That will mean a lot, Tim. Some of you may have seen the hit piece on Desmond in the star. And we know that that, piece came because of Desmond's work challenging power in all its spaces, including elite Black power, which we are not allowed to talk about. So um, I'm really gratified to see that love. It's been a really, really rough time when you stand up to the state and you stand up to its agents, you really get a backlash. So I'm like taking pictures of the chat for him. Um, so thank you so much. All that, uh, that will mean a lot to him. Um, beyond that, uh, I really want to us always to return, as you said to Clayton, to our elders in our community. We rightly talk a lot about the youth because youth bring so much fire in our community, but we often forget about the elders. Um, you know, some people are liking what I'm saying. I was trained by elders in my community who taught me how to stand up, how to go back to my community, how to like make sure I'm always checking myself. You know, that comes from like Miss Lynn Jones, Dr. Lynn Jones, uh, the sister of Rocky Jones, of course. It comes from so many of the women in my community that are in their 70s and 80s and 90s and still doing it off. I can't wait until I make it to that age and I can just mess with people, you know, so. Um, Take your time, there's no hurry. Yeah, like let's not forget our elders. And I hope in 2022, we just find those, you know, like, I mean, the women that are in the anti-war movement holding it down every year. We have the Halifax International Security Forum in Halifax, um, which and there's always like 12 women outside protesting the voices of women like our elders that have been out here fighting since like the 60s, 70s fighting nuclear power. So um, and the last person I want to shout is, is Sarah, Sarah Java. She was one of the people arrested in Hamilton, uh, fighting the encampment clearance. She does a lot of work linking disability justice, racial justice, uh, justice for the unhoused. Um, you know, mm -hmm. she's all about it, always doing it. We really see Sarah, we love what she's doing for us. So I'll end my shout outs with her. But of course, there's so many people. When you start shouting out, you feel like you could go on forever. Uh, I'm just keeping my eye on the time and uh, we do want to try and get to um, uh, some questions from folks who tuned in. And um, a couple questions that came in had to do with your comments, um, Elle and others, um, about policing, uh, uh, violence uh, in policing, 
uh, defund the police and it and noting that it's a very important movement that's happening. Um, yet the, the question is, it's as if we haven't heard anything about that in the speech from the throne. Can the panel talk concretely about what we can demand at, of federal politicians? And it is interesting that the, the movement has mostly been uh, a focus at the local level. And of course we have the RCMP, um, the federal force. So any, any thoughts from any of you about the whole defund the police movement and how that can be um, raised up in terms of a, more of a national movement debate? So I'll just leap in since you raised this yeah. very Canadian um, issue of is this federal or is this provincial or is this what? But it is true in Canada that uh, police are the responsibility largely of the provinces and the cities and the federal government i mean the or the federal government in canada appears to have more control over the police than it does because in uh, in most of the provinces the provincial police are a rent a cop service from the rcmp but when the rcmp people come visiting you in british columbia uh, I don't want to embarrass the government of British Columbia, but they're taking orders from the government of British Columbia. They're not taking orders from the headquarters in, in Regina or Ottawa. They are at, they are the provincial police of British Columbia, just as the provincial police of Ontario, which is a separate force in Ontario, is the provincial police force. So if you're talking about what the federal government can really do, where the federal government has total control is in criminal legislation. Unlike the United States, in the United States, what is a crime in Wisconsin is not necessarily a crime in Minnesota. We saw that with these weird self-defense laws and right to carry gun laws and all this. That changes from state to state. I mean, during, after the Kyle Rittenhouse affair, people said, well, if he'd done that in Connecticut, he'd be in jail because you can't walk down the street with a gun and say, oh, I'm just defending yourself. But in Wisconsin, you can. Not in Canada. In Canada, the federal government has 100% control over the criminal law. The provinces have much of the control over the administration and the enforcement uh, of the criminal law. So what you have to do is push this government to take that seriously. And the other thing the government does control is a lot of the penitentiaries. Those are the where people are sent away. The federal government gets the people once somebody else finds them guilty and arrests them and then has to deal with them. And the federal government determines what is the law. And you have to start looking at the ways in which all kinds of bias are built into the uh, the criminal law and start pushing the government. It's worth it in a way to be focused in your actions in that way. I mean, it, it is true that the federal government gives money to the provinces for all kinds of stuff. You know, supposedly the money that the big check the federal government writes to every province, the Canada Health and Social Transfer, or they keep changing its name, is supposedly for health and social services, but they actually don't look over the shoulder of the provinces to, to ask them what they're doing with it. And you could say, this may not be used for coercive, for coercive practices. This is to be used for beneficial social practices. You may not take a penny of this. They do attack, they have this Canada Health Act. You can, you can have the Canada Peace and Justice Act or something like that, that determines this is the conditions on which we give you money to the provinces. And one thing is, it doesn't go into fattening the police force and giving them bigger guns and fancier cars. Hey, and any so quick an comment from, from any of the other panelists on um, police funding and defund the police? Just very, very quickly, I will give a long yeah, answer. Al. But you can read my 200 page report, they'll be coming out <laughs> from the defund the committee, police committee in Halifax. But Policing and capitalism go hand in hand, as do racism and capitalism. Uh, in capitalism, we pay for what we value, and we have an ideology of punishment right now that says that um, we've been defunding public services forever, and what we've been funding is the police and then using them to fill the gaps. So um, this is a product of capitalism, of pushing more and more people out of society. So it's not just about the project of removing the budget. We also have to rethink how we care for each other, you know, what it means to actually build our communities. We need to, as Leah was talking about, you know, organize within our communities so that our people are not being taken away and punished. I could go on longer, but I know we have more questions, so I'll stop. Um, when, when does your report come out? No. Um, it's written. We're just wait, wait, waiting on the graphic designer. So this is uh, the okay. our report to the police board. But um, we were hoping December, but it might be January now. 
Okay. Um, yeah, just just one comment on that, yeah, you know, Clayton. on the police funding issue. Um, you know, disproportionately in this country, federally, provincially, you know, the execution of, 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 of police, um, you know, uh, funding, um, you know, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but there's been a lot of like, you know, call in the national discourse for full disclosure of how, exactly how much of total police funding in this country is spent on indigenous surveillance, enforcement of, um, you know, uh, of, of um, you know, judge orders, what are they called? Um, um, uh, indictments or uh, what is it called when there's an or a general order not to go to a place or you'll get arrested? What's that Injunctions. Called? Yeah. Injunctions. Injunctions yeah. and the criminalization of grassroots indigenous peoples like what we've seen for the last three years with the three federal RCMP raids of Wet'suwet'en territory where, you know, RCMP with canine units and like semi-automatic rifles are literally cutting down the cabin doors with chainsaws to unarmed indigenous women, um, you know, who are just quite simply totally legally out on their lands. And, um, you know, this is a really, really bad issue. It's super immoral. And, um, you know, we need to get to the bottom of that because um, the federal government and, you know, I think Carl laid it out perfectly as far as the jurisdictional conundrum that the province, or that the provincial governments and the federal government loves to benefit from as far as the confusion and chaos it creates, um, you know, but the fact of the matter is, is the RCMP, whether, you know, it's through contracts with governments like the Oregon government in B.C., um, or the federal government in jurisdictions where they're operating on behalf of the federal jurisdiction, um, you know, they continue to be manipulated for the agenda of multinational and domestic extractive corporations in the criminalization of indigenous, of indigenous peoples and the dispossession of those indigenous peoples from their homelands, the forced removal, um, which is crazy in 2021. Um, just one last quick question, which I think maybe Leah, you might want to pick up. Um, the question is, um, is there a way that the federal government um, could do much more work in, for example, creating crown corporations and increasing government departments to both limit the profits and force private sector to limit their damage? This is in terms of a climate emergency and generate the activities to solve the crisis in an equitable manner. So to you know, have more of that, I think those are some of the issues that Seth Klein really speaks to um, in his uh, recent book. Um, any thoughts on that, Leah, in terms of the role of the federal government and you know, increasing the public sector involvement in uh, the, the climate and have, emergency? And you, and, and you have one minute, Leah. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, fast, fast back. You know what? Uh, politics is about choices and political will. Uh, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, that is possible. But I think, you know, right now we have uh, governments that are interested in uh, subsidizing corporate corporate interests, upholding their interests through militarized police. I think it'll take people to push that. I do think it's possible. I think it's about political will and political choice. And I think that political will and political choice will come from the movement and push from people on the ground. How was that, Robin? Uh, perfect. There you go. <laughs> perfect. So, uh, so thank you very much. That is all the time we have for questions today. And so thanks to our audience members for, uh, again, excellent questions. And and thanks so much to all our panelists, Leah Gazan, L. Jones, Clayton Thomas Mueller, and Carl Nuenberg, and to my co-host, Libby Davies. Uh, Off the Hill will be back in 2022. So be sure to sign up for Rabble's newsletter at rabble.ca slash alerts to make sure you get the invitation. Um, and finally, uh, thank you to Rabble for creating this space to host these important discussions. As always, we encourage you, you to help Rabble up by becoming a monthly donor at rabble.ca uh, uh, slash donate. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Rabble, and thanks night, everybody for tuning in. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Everyone. Have a good night. Bye.